How you doing? How you been? What's going on? What's good? How you getting in? Everybody getting in front of you. What's going on, people? What's going on, people? It is a day of another day. Of another day that we call Monday. Anybody being said, what's going to people? Uh, hope everybody had a safe weekend and stuff. And, you know, you're doing everything as far as prosperity within your life and stuff. And, you know, just fixing this a little bit. Anyway, um, I want to talk to you about something. Now, I don't know if you know about this, but um, I just thought it was very good information, you know, to share with you in reference to something that I stumbled across. And I thought it'd be good um, in case you didn't know about something. And I always try to share different things that I learn, you know, when I go through my Opala life. Anyway, that being said, um, I want to share with you. I don't know if you've ever been to New York and stuff, but down at the World Trade Center, they had a church down there. Now, this church is called, I believe, St. Paul's Church. Um, now, this church have um, a lot of slave bodies in there. Now I didn't never know this when I went down to um, you know Ground Zero. It was World Trade Center when I was down there. But um, it's called Ground Zero now, you know, because of the World Trade Center, and you know. Anyway, the event said. So um, I came across a document in reference to a woman by the name of Dr. Joy DeGru. Okay. Now she wrote a book in reference to post-traumatic slave syndrome. Okay. Now, the reason why she's sharing this story is because slaves have been, you know, black people want slaves, we already know this, and the thing about it is that once they were freed, black people still carried the mentality of, you know, being still being a slave because they never had therapy. You know, back in those days, they wasn't quite doing therapy and stuff like that. So people, black people just carried on as far as, you know, the tradition and, you know, just moved forward and without the knowledge of anything, they just did the best, you know, basically they could do, you know as far as their life you know and the thing about it is that I thought it was very good information I want to share this information with you that I found you know with her, her within her dialogue and her story in reference to us that I know a lot of times when it comes down to us as far as black people we're not taught this information and through the history books we're really not taught about these different things basically we're told we're slaves and that was basically it so I want to give you the information in reference to Thomas Jefferson, in case you don't know. Here he is. Okay. He was one of the presidents. And the thing about it was that I knew when it came down to black people, the dialogue as far as the information in reference to us is not really a positive one. So I was very surprised when I heard the, the information in reference to him. You know, but I want to share this with you because I don't know if you know about this because now he's on a $2 bill. You know, and the thing about it is that they try to move Harry Tubman, you know, to the, um, and it was that black people signed an order after so they was like, you know, um, they didn't want black people on them bill as far as they didn't want her up there and stuff, they protesting and stuff. You know, but not going to go into that, the president reference to that, um, about the slave owners and stuff. So, you know, as in Dr., um, excuse me, as in Thomas Jefferson's, in his words, he says, I cannot live without books. Okay, so now I'm going to let you hear the storyline in reference to him and what he's done in reference to black people and the information I don't know if you knew. Here is Food for the Soul. Here it is. You all know him? 
Yes, he's one of my favorite people, actually. I close out my book with a soliloquy from Thomas Jefferson. I actually end my book with it. Because Thomas Jefferson made a statement. Here's a man highly regarded in the United States. I mean, there are more statues of him than probably anybody. And he made a statement towards the end of his life. He says, indeed, I tremble for my country when I consider that God is just and that his justice cannot sleep forever. You see, it haunted him to his grave because Thomas Jefferson knew. He knew what would happen. Matter of fact, he predicted exactly what we're dealing with today, what happened between people of African descent and those of European descent. Predicted it. He was a bright man. How do you reconcile behaving in such a barbaric way? Well, let's see what he said. He said uh, blacks smelled bad and were physically unattractive. Well, this was inconsistent with his behavior because, you know, he fathered slaves, Sally Hemings. So it didn't smell that bad, huh? <laughs> now, here's a more important one. He said we required less sleep. Now, that one's more interesting to me. Why would he need to, what dissonance was he feeling that he would need to believe that blacks required less sleep? Why? What did he do? You know, he owned slaves. So what do you think, how hard do you think he worked them? What was the work day for a slave? Sunrise to sunset. But do you have any empirical evidence, Joy? Can you prove that? Because you know, can't, if, if you can't write, you know, count it and measure it, it didn't happen in European culture. Is that correct? You've got to count it and measure it. How many of you have measurable objectives? <laughs> measurable outcomes. You better measure it. I don't care if you tell them. Can you tell your boss, really, truly, at the end of the year, we're doing better now? <laughs> I've been to work every single day I've watched, and I can guarantee you we're doing better. Is that going to fly? <laughs> That would be no. That means you have to count it and measure it. And if you didn't count and measure, it didn't happen. So when you start looking at the notion of requiring less sleep, that's an interesting thing because I have to believe if I work you that hard. And boy, I, I got humbled when I found out how hard folks worked in the sugar plantations. Ooh wee, I got humbled by how hard folks in the Caribbean were worked. But what I decided to do is I looked at the Library of Congress. Most of my work over the nine years that it took to write the book, six years of that was research. The other part of it had to do with doing um, interviews of elders and reading slave narratives. And there are thousands of them. This is just one taken from the Library of Congress. Sarah Gudger from North Carolina wrote, never known nothing but work, never knew rest, felt like my back was going to break. This is the gospel truth. Then I looked at uh, what happened in the sugar plantations, and this was amazing. One final set of grim numbers underlines the way slaves on sugar plantations like Covington, uh, it was a plantation in Barbados, were systematically worked to an early death. When slavery ended in the United States, slaves imported over the centuries had grown to a population of nearly 4 million. When it ended in the British West Indies, total slave imports of well over 2 million left a surviving slave population of only about 670,000. More than twice as many slaves were shipped to the island of Jamaica alone than all 13 uh, North American American colonies combined, the Caribbean was a slaughterhouse. In fact, the reason why there was more importation of slaves to these plantations is because they died so frequently. They were treated so badly, ate so poorly, that females never reached their menstrual cycles. They never actually started their menstrual cycles, so they couldn't reproduce, you see. And so many of them died, they had to import more. That's how treacherous was, you lazy black folks that you are. Isn't that ironic, though? What's so ironic is black people run from the shame of feeling like they're perceived as lazy. I, I mean, I live with that so much that when I would go to hotels, I would leave it cleaner. Because <laughs> your mother, everybody's mother taught you, leave it cleaner than... 
You found it. So black folks are so hypersensitive, I was cleaning up the hotel room. Because I wouldn't want anyone to think I'm dirty. Right? Now, all the people in the audience that are of color, how much harder did your parents tell you you had to work to get to even? How much harder? You had to work twice as hard. Now, how come I knew that about you? How come I knew that? Think about it. And yet, at the same time, white people think we're lazy, you see? But we're so hypersensitive because of the shame, right? And then our ancestors will work to death. To death. Recently, they unearthed a slave cemetery. They unearthed actually a slave uh, cemetery in um, New York City. It's on Wall Street, by the way. In the shadow of the blue. Unearthed a slave cemetery, and they still to this day they're struggling. They recently, you know, have done a lot in terms of commemoration. I went to the, it took me everything to get to it. They had it blocked off so you couldn't get to it. But they, because they didn't want to deal with it. You know, you can't just bulldoze a cemetery. So here in all these skyscrapers in the middle of it is this little cemetery. And there are slaves in that cemetery. More important than that was what the bones told us. Because, you know, now, you know, you got CSI. <laughs> Hell, I can go in there and tell you what's going on now. <laughs> you know, so with the CSI thing, now, I, you know, they, they discovered a little bit about the bones. And to me, the most phenomenal thing about the bones is what they told us about those people and how they live. Majority of the people in there were children, infants and children, high mortality, infant mortality rate. They even know what they died of died of uh, malnutrition and starvation because they could tell by the rotting of the teeth in the jawline so even though they most likely grew food they weren't allowed to eat it and then they found something even more peculiar that speaks to this idea of why he believed we cried less sleep they would show a large frame man and they would find an injury where the muscle actually detached itself from the bone as a result of exertion and not injury. Stay with me. It, it detaches itself from the bone as a result of exertion. That means you work so hard the muscle detached itself from the bone. You don't see those kind of injuries in contemporary society because no one's going to work that hard. Unless, of course, you have a gun trained on you from sunrise to sunset. So we do have empirical evidence of how hard folks work. Then he went on to say that we were dumb, cowardly, and incapable of feeling grief. Why would Thomas Jefferson need to believe that? Why would he need to believe we didn't feel grief? What was he doing, do you think, that produced cognitive dissonance? You were killing people? Not only were you killing people, beating them, you were selling them, yes? Selling mothers away from their children and husbands away from wives. And surely they don't feel it. Because if they felt it, that would make them human like me. So I simply say, you see, it's not so much, not, it's not even so much that he said it, but he was an important person. If Joe, nobody said it, but he said it. So what do you think the rest of the folks, uneducated uh, laborers, believed? Well, they don't feel grief, you know. After all, Thomas Jefferson says they don't. So he becomes a critical person in making those statements. But you see, it was all to relieve and to settle the conscience that he died with. But these become very important as you see how these things okay, move forward. That. Wow. You know, thank you, um, Dr. Joy, because the thing about it is that, you know, we go through life and stuff, we carry so much baggage and stuff, but really don't quite understand a lot of things. You know, and the thing about it is that, you know, we've been hurt, we've been told to start references to slaves and stuff, and, you know, they, they were praying to God and stuff, and we seem to transcend this back on to our ancestors on to now. And the thing about it is that I have to... I understand a lot of young, younger you, younger viewers and younger people. You know, I was like, oh, the slavery stuff. I'd be glad because I was this. I'm only repeating what I was told. 
um, I was told that, you know, they really don't want to hear about the, bl you know, the black storyline. This is black people. This is not white people or Chinese. This is actually coming from black people's mouths. Um, not everyone, but I'm talking about the ones that interact with me. They were saying to, I was told, I don't want to hear about the slavery stuff. I heard about it enough. Once you all die out, we can finally go, you know, live our life as far as being normal. And you can stop hearing about the slavery stuff. And the reason why I'm doing this video reference to that and reference to what I was told, you know, and the sad part about it, I was not only told this by one person who was black, but I was told this by a few younger black people. That once us older black people die out, we can stop, you know, re rekindling the thing as far as, you know, the black storylines and the slavery on the ships and, you know, the slavery as far as women and, you know, the children being sold and the slavery and, you know, the thing about it is that they're tired of hearing about it when it's dial. And the reason why I try to share this information to you because the simple fact of the matter is why there are of our colored people are waiting for us to die out. It is now 2016 and we are dying out. We're not dying out exactly, I believe, the way that you were thinking. We're dying out because of the way we're being murdered on the streets. And the sad part about it is that we're saying, you know, um, Black Lives Matter. And they somehow managed to turn it around and go, well, all lives matter. And the reason why they say that black lives matter, it is not a, a strike at the white people. It is not a strike at the Indian people. It is not a strike at Chinese people. You know what I'm saying? It is an indication to let you know, hey, stop killing us. the message. Now the sad part about it, which is a good thing but a bad thing, the sad part about it is that there are a lot of white people who see this as happening and they are trying to help black people. And this is a very good thing but the thing about it is that those who are going to listen will listen. Those who won't refuse to and won't. You know and the sad part about it is that I find it so discouraging that when you see someone who is black who's like, well, I don't want to hear this. I, don't, I really don't care. Until it knocks on your door, until it happens to you, then you'll care. You know, and the sad part about it is that even this information I'm sharing with you, I'm sure the ones who want to hear it is going to hear it. And the ones who don't, probably already clicked it on because they were a little careless. Understand one thing. History is repeating itself. And the thing about it is that it's not just started to repeat itself. It's been going on for the longest. And to me, I feel as though our ancestors are people who have been murdered. We're, we're actually getting a chance to hear the stories to the grave because modern technology have moved forward that we have cell phones now just imagine how many people have been murdered that has not been documented that has not been documented on cell phones you know the thing about it is that there are some people who actually did the cell phones and stuff that we never even saw the videos you know and the thing about it is that we've been blessed with this information to give people a chance and the thing about it that makes it even worse we bring the presentation of the deaths we bring it on the judges tables and let them see what actually happened and it's dismissed in court and a lot of times when it comes down to cops and stuff killing black people if you have a judge sitting up there saying oh it's okay it's just a black person then that takes us back to slavery and that's the sad part about my black people who say 
oh, you ready for us to die out? Oh, we're dying out. But not exactly the way you said within that storyline you're sharing. You know, and the sad part about it is that if you don't want to listen, society's going to make you listen. Because until the knocks on your door, and trust me, one day it may, even, my, even me, I'm not exempt. The thing about it is that we're being murdered at a higher rate. And the thing about it, I try to encourage you to keep your eyes open to it. It's because until you realize what's happening, you're never going to realize that the future that you're looking for is never going to happen. And I understand people saying, well, that's just a jaded type of way, but I'm not making this storyline. The covers are being pulled right before your eyes. The sheets are being pulled off the bed. And everything you're seeing lies beneath it. It's looking like you. And as a counterpart, if you look at our European as our white people, Caucasian people are walking away unharmed. We're being murdered. The same way we're being murdered back in slavery time. Anyway, you know, this is not a, um, a video reference to bashing anyone, but it was a video, it's a video reference to by black people who sit back and say to me, once you all die out, you can the sad part is, is we are dying out and we're still fighting. You know, and I always encourage people to always fight and stuff, you know, because um, even though we have people who are doing mean things, there's always someone watching. Someone sees what's going on. And the thing about it is that, you know, with um, Thomas Jefferson, with the storyline she shared with them, with us, um, she was basically saying what he thought of us. You know, and the sad part about it is sometimes people could say things to you long enough that they don't say them more because now you're sharing the message and now you believe everything that's said about you. And the sad part about it when it comes down to Black Lives Matter and stuff, it's not a fact of we hate anybody. Well, I know I don't. It's not a fact of hating anyone. It's not a fact of hurting anyone. It's not even a fact of hating cops. It's the fact of, just stop killing us. You know, and it, I'm not going to make this video much longer because it's long enough. But, you know, it's just something I want to share with you. A reference to the church that has dead bodies of children in it. Down by the World Trade Center. So, I understand that the World Trade Center was a horrific, horrible thing. And I used to be down there. Actually, I was down every Friday. But the sad part about it was... We walked past that church every day and didn't realize there were babies, women, like us, that was already dead down there before the bodies fell from the building. There were dead bodies on the graves. Dead souls. You know, and it's horrible. It almost reminded me of Poltergeist the movie, if you don't know what I'm saying. Both the guys in the movie was talking about building houses on top of graves. And what happened was, when the post guys moved when they built the house, so they, asked them, they asked them, did they move the bodies? They didn't move the bodies, they just moved the tombstones. And that's something to think about when you think of Ground Zero. Did they actually move the bodies or did they just move the tombstones? Anyway, that being said, I just want to say that I love you. And I would just want to say thank you for watching. And I want to say hello, my dolls. Meow. And I just want to know how you feel about this. Did you know about this? How do you feel about this? And I want to say hello, my kings. Woof. I want to say hello, new people. Boom. I want to say oh people. Bam. And I want to thank you for watching. Thank you for subscribing. You did you. I want you the best way that you can, and then nobody likes it. Welcome.